Welcome back to the Oncology Brothers podcast. I'm Rahul Gosain here with my brother and co-host, Rohit Gosain. In the last three months, we've seen close to 10 new approvals or indications in hematology and oncology. And as a community oncologist, you need to be up to date with all these recent advances. Today, we're focusing on one of these FDA approvals, Zanadatumab, a bispecific HER2 antibody, which is now indeed approved for HER2 amplified, unresectable, locally advanced or metastatic biliary tract cancer. To help us unpack this approval based off Horizon BTC01 study, we're joined by Dr. Shubham Pant, a GI medical oncologist at the MD Anderson Cancer Center, who is also one of the authors in this study. Shubham, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you for having me. Shubham, welcome. Before we dive into Horizon BTC01, it is important to lay the foundation of biliary tract cancer which mainly comprises of intrahepatic cholangio, extrahepatic, and gallbladder, which makes about 1% of solid cancers. And in advanced metastatic settings, we were utilizing gemcitabine and cisplatin until recent approvals of darvalumab and pembrolizumab, and now we are doing the triplet regimen. Looking for an actionable mutation is very critical in this particular disease because it certainly opens up more doors for our treatment. This subset of patients that we are here talking about today is HER2 positive. In April 2024, we saw a bucket approval of TDXD, which is mainly for all solid malignancies. Now, for biliary tract cancers, we have zanidatumab based off of this particular study. Shubham, can you please, with this background, go, go through the study design and the patient characteristics? Thank you for that. You, you said the right thing. What happens in biliary tract cancer is you have to do the next-gen sequencing because if you don't look, you won't find we have HER2 now as a valid target, FGFR, IDH1, obviously different validated targets. So it's very important to look. That's the first thing. Now coming to this trial, this is a very interesting drug. It's actually a, something called a biparatropic drug. So it's not a classic bispecific that gives you CRS or any issues like that. It's also called a biparatropic drug. It binds to two domains on the HER2, ECD2 and ECD4. And that's similar to where trastuzumab, pertuzumab bind, but just having two drugs in one improves the response rate compared to historical controls because it has better receptor internalization. So there's preclinical data that it has better receptor internalization and maybe the effectiveness is a little, little bit more. We'll never know the clinical, right? We can't do a randomized control trial in this rare setting, but I can tell you it's a very unique drug. So this was born out of a phase one trial that we did a basket phase one trial in, at MD Anderson. We actually saw early responses in a few of our patients. It was really amazing. These ability track patients, especially gallbladder cancer, HER2 amplification is different amongst biliary tract cancers. It's very heterogeneous. So if you have extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is different than intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is different than gallbladder cancer. So gallbladder cancer can have about up to a 30% HER2 amplification. Intrahepatic is less 5 to 10%. So really should be testing these patients. We saw a response early in the gallbladder patient, had a great response, went pain-free. And then we developed this global phase two trial which we launched a few months before COVID hit the world. It was challenging, but we still enrolled this trial. It's truly a global trial across four continents. And essentially, this was for patients with biliary tract cancers advanced, as you said, uh, who had failed at least one line of prior therapy. They got this single agent, bipatotropic, bispecific, HER2 antibody, IV every two weeks. We looked at the overall response rate as a primary objective. Interestingly, we had two cohorts. One cohort was, e uh, was HER2 0 and 1 plus on IHC. All the patients were ish positive, in situ hybridization positive. The second cohort we reported was HER2 2 plus or 3 plus. And HER2 0, 1 plus, we really didn't see a lot of responses. Seven patients, no new safety signals. We did not follow through with that cohort. What we reported were the 80 patients on this HER2 2 plus and 3 plus cohort. Got this done in two, two years. These are exciting times for our patients. And just a few things to reiterate what you mentioned, this is not the most common malignancies we see in our uh, clinic today, just about 1%. But testing for HER2 is so important, not only for biliary tract. Here we're seeing that 30% of gallbladder patients have HER2 positive disease, but just now with these bucket approvals, that is so critical. Shubham, can you share the key findings from the study? Yes, the key findings were, you know, so this, again, you know, first was overall response rate. So to give your listeners a historical kind of unselected concept, if you have unselected patients, the trial uh, tested full FOX versus best supportive care. And the response rate was about 5% in the un unselected population. In this population, you know, I was expecting, hey, it'll be better than that. But when we saw the results, 
it was about 41%, 41.3% to be exact. And that's one part of it, Rahul. But the important thing is, you know, so let's say in our practice, a patient has a great response, more than 30% decrease in recessed lesions. And then you do the scan next time, right? So two months you do a scan, looks great. You high five the patient. This is great. The patient comes the next time and they've already grown, right? So it's not about getting that response, but maintaining that response, right? Absolutely. So that's important. The important thing in this was when we first reported this in ASCO last year, the duration of response was 12.9 months. This year, when we reported the results, the duration of a response actually came up. It was 14.9 months. So, you know, so response rates, we are seeing high response rates with her to targeted agents in BTC. But this is one of the unique ones. We can't do cross trial comparisons. These are small numbers. This is unique because the duration of response was that. Once that patient got that response, they kept on going on this response. At Anderson, we still have one patient who actually went two years, right? So this trial is two years. Still getting a response. It's about that ongoing response, which was exciting. And again, an important thing is the approval is in HER2 3 plus. So we did HER2 2 plus and HER2 3 plus. The response rate in HER2 3 plus were even higher. They were close to 52%. HER2 2 plus for 5%. You got the response. But I think the duration of response, I think as a clinician, that's what really excites me. Well, Shabam, congratulations on this work because this is an additional therapy that is added to our back pocket now. It is exciting to see a lot of this HER2 space getting crowded. The question is going to be how to sequence them. But before we dive into that, it is important to understand how we even define HER2 positive space. As you stated, the response do differ. In breast cancer, we tend to be uh, relying on IHC 3 plus or 2 plus fish amplified. For lung cancer, we have seen most activity with HER2 mutation. And TDXD bucket approval and zenodatumab approval is on IHC 3 plus. Though I wouldn't be surprised if at least in community or outside of FDA approvals or FDA labels, we are still utilizing these drugs because mm -hmm. these patients are associated with poor prognosis. One thing I forgot to mention was this was the only trial with HER2 amplified BTC, specifically for that indication. The rest, more basket trials, all of the results are great. So I think it's more options for our patients, whether it's ADC, antibody like, like Zani, any other trial. So I think that's the exciting part. As you're showing here, the median overall survival for IHC 3 plus was 18.1 months. That's, that's, that's pretty cool. But you're right. I think the main thing is, I mean, breast cancers went from IHC 3 plus to IHC 0. Her to low, low, low. But yeah, for, for biliary tract cancers, when you look at it, it mostly seems to be driven by HER2 3 plus. So testing the IHC is important. Now, the important question is, like a lot of the times, folks don't do IHC, right? You do the NGS and it shows amplified. Now, what do you do about the approval is not for that. But I'm guessing if you're HER2 amplified with one of the CLIA certified tests, Chances you're HER2 3 plus, you know, then concordance could be there, though we have to know we're looking at our data set in this trial to really look at the biomarker and see how that matches up. So I think that's another important fact. When we do it, it's a rarer disease, right? We don't have so much tissue in this. Unlike breast cancer, we have sometimes a little bit of FNA. It's a little bit harder in this. But I think if you're HER2 amplified on a NGS test, right? I think you should definitely do the IHC. There could be a good concordance between the two, but you should do the I had seen all your patients because of all this, because of, you know, trastuzumab, deroxtecan, because of Xanidatum have approval. So I think, you know, you should do that because it seems to be driven on that IHC 3 plus side, the benefit, a lot of the benefit. Absolutely. In the community, we're so used to NGS, but at the end of the day, HER2 is available in-house IHC. I don't yeah. have to wait for that NGS. The quick turnaround is also something we have to keep in mind for these in-house testing. Rohit, I know you briefly touched on this, but let's talk a little more of sequencing, especially when it comes to HER2 positive disease in community as breast cancer, right. or when I'm treating that, we sequence HER2 agents from the get-go, right? And we've seen the similar paradigm in upper GI. That was not the case, but now HER2 agents are used upfront. Then at the time of progression, we're still pushing for more HER2 agents. For biliary tract cancer, Shubham, would you use Zenidatumab and then still consider TDXD or vice versa for these HER2 positive patients? Great question. First of all, I don't know how you guys do it, man. I don't know how you guys see a lymphoma, <laughs> then a breast cancer, then a pancreatic, then a colorectal. It's a good thing, right? But it is tough. So I'm glad Absolutely. there are folks like you who are providing all this information. This is so, so co very commendable. So I'll tell you, it, there are two different things. I'm going to take the two common ones, right? Trastumid, deroxitacan, and Zanidatumab. Obviously, you know, 
my conflict of interest. I've shown the slides and everything. I was one of the main global co-chairs of this trial. So I've used this drug. Zani data map has not been approved for anything else. So folks haven't used it, right? Yes. But I can tell you in use, diarrhea is the main side effect, but it's controlled by Imodium. You have to keep a check on that, but it's not like Arino TK and diarrhea. It's actually easier to uh, control. There was infusion reactions, but everybody gets pre-medications. Now, after that, we really didn't see a lot of infusion reactions. Did not see pneumonitis. One patient had a kind of toxicity, which was a pulmonary toxicity, but not a high rate of pneumonitis. So it's actually for these patients, you know, who really get going, it's very well tolerated. You just keep on giving it like, you know, when I had this patient on this trial and everything, you treat a number of them in the phase one setting, right? In the basket setting in which we did have breasts and others in this trial. It's, it's, it's for me, you know, it was a honestly a remarkably easy drug to give because it just really did not have any serious, serious side effect. There were some patients where the EF lower, but even that, if you follow it, it was not any more than, let's say, trastuzumab that I had to really worry about. I didn't have anybody in my small cohort that really I had that issue. But I think it's, a, it's an incredibly well-tolerated drug overall. For my ADC use, I can tell you, I don't treat breast cancer now. I used to treat it in my previous life. But, you know, for me, the ones I have used, EDXZ, and it's a really good drug, it does have side effects associated with it. When I tell patients, I say it's most like starting chemo. They've just come off Gemsys, Dervalumab. So they're a little beat up. That's my consideration. If you've used it a lot, it could be muscle memories. You guys are probably better at it than me. For me personally, I would maybe give them Xanidatamab because I think it would give them a chemo break. And then if I feel that, I still feel like I have that punch with ADC. I think that patients can stay on. Bilirubin tract cancer is not like pancreatic cancer. These patients can stay on to get multiple lines of therapy, especially her to directed therapy. So I think, you know, my thought for me would be to give Zani. Then if they progress, give trastuzumab or directed to can. But if you do it the other way, that should be fine. Also, that's my thought about sequences: giving them a break from chemo, seeing this agent. I still have something in my back pocket to give. But it depends on how you've used it, who's used it. I think once folks start using Zani. It's not a tough drug to use. It's a bi-specific. There's no CRS or anything. So it's not like a CD3 linked compound. So I think Absolutely. that's kind of my thought overall of doing right. sequencing. But I encourage everybody to do what they feel comfortable with, right? Absolutely. Because and both good drugs, great options for our patients. Certainly TDXD has great responsiveness. We are certainly used to it because of utilizing in breast cancer space and other bucket approval. However, we cannot undermine the mortality that is associated with ILD with TDXD. Certainly, we will get used to zenidatumab. Now, touching importantly for the side effect profile, as you stated, infusion-related reaction, diarrhea, in terms of dose reductions or dose interruptions, how do you manage uh, some of the important clinical pearls, at least from community oncology standpoint, that we need to be aware of? I really didn't have to interrupt anybody. Most of my patients came off after some time for progression of disease. But as you can see, you won't do it for infusion-related reactions. I look at the grade three is 1%. Right. Essentially, if you pre-med them, they're really not going to have that. For the confirmed cardiac events, they can be stopped and everything, but it would be an, a rare phenomenon. One more thing about the ADC is the toxicity profile could be different in different malignancies. Right. So coming back to the first question, the tox profile could be a little different in biliary because I've seen a lot more fatigue than I've heard happens with breast cancer. So again, the, coming back to that original point of like, maybe it works differently in different malignancies. Absolutely. And again, one thing to mention in that about TDXD, yes, a lot of the discussion around that ends up being ILD, but nausea, fatigue, alopecia are big things that we have to worry about. Shivam, before we close, this was an accelerated approval. I take there are larger studies on its way. Yes. What should be on our radar for this drug in the community settings in the near future? Any combination trials? Yes. And that's the main thing, right? There's an accelerated approval, single arm study. So we have already launched another global trial in America, specifically in the frontline setting. So again, that tells you about the combination of this drug, right? We're combining it with GEM, CIS, and Derva, Pembro with or without this drug. So I'm telling you, that's why on single agent, think about combining other agents like GEM, CIS, Derva, or Pembro. It's, that's another Absolutely. challenge. But similarly, as you do in the upper GF, you do the combi combination and everything with a checkpoint and with Pembro, with Folfox. And then Absolutely. you have prostuzumab, kind of the similar concept. So that global trial is launched as the frontline setting, but we did recognize that patients show up and then you want to get started, right? You don't want to wait for things. What I would recommend is, especially for all the community oncologists, if you have a patient with biliary tract cancer, 
just do an IHC on them. The trial is run globally, multiple centers. There'll be a center near you if you don't have it. You can actually give up to two cycles of chemotherapy with immunotherapy before add the drug on, basically. So it's a unique design, but we did it because it's a rare patient population. We really didn't want to miss any patients. We think moving it early will really improve Absolutely. those outcomes for these patients. Similarly, as it's done in upper GI. But if you don't test, we won't find. I would really encourage your colleagues and folks in the community. I mean, especially gallbladders can be up to 30%. Yep. You know, don't test yep. them. Just do a quick IHC, as you were saying. If you're not running the trial, there's probably a center very near you. In the U.S., we tried not to have more than 100-mile radius, you know, to not to have a center. Probably be a center near you, uh, you know, who is who has a trial going. And they can even join after the first two cycles. So it gives a six-week kind of window to enroll that patient onto that trial. Well, certainly exciting times. And the key takeaways, as you mentioned, Shubham, is that IHC positivity is the key and one should be testing for it. And other is that biliary tract cancer, as we've stated, that it is not common. So utilizing the need for tertiary care center, multidisciplinary approach, and getting them on the right clinical trial is extremely important. Dr. Pond, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and thoughts on this recent approvals and study led by you and your colleagues. Zanidatumab is now approved for HER2 positive biliary tract cancer based on Horizon BTC01 study. For our listeners, let us go over a quick recap. In our discussion today with Dr. Shubham Pang from MD Anderson Cancer Center, we had a chance to discuss the recent accelerated FDA approval of Zanidatumab in HER2 amplified locally advanced or metastatic biliary tract cancer. The Horizon BTC01 study that led to this approval showed an overall response of 41% and a median duration of response of 14.9 months. With bucket approval for TDXD and now zenodatumab, HER2 testing should be considered for all advanced biliary tract cancer patients. With zenodatumab, it is important to keep diarrhea, infusion-related reactions in mind. Thanks for joining us. Make sure to check out our other discussions around conference highlights, treatment algorithms, recent FDA approvals, and talks check for these approvals. We look forward to seeing you at GI ASCO 2025 in person.